So uh, the world has just witnessed a massacre in Las Vegas over the weekend. Uh, we've seen more and more such lone wolf act of violence and terrorism act, which is horrible. Um, do you think the world we know is about to come out of its comfort zone? Yes, I think we will see increasing tragic events. Um, of course, they have different origins and what the origins are of the event in Las Vegas are very different to say the events uh, in Paris or London or in many, many other cities. Um, but what they, I think, have in common is firstly, we see them very immediately. Uh, we feel very close to them. We see them in graphic detail. Uh, that makes it, I think, very tough uh, for everyone around the world. We feel it uh, more dramatically. Um, the solutions are different. In the case, I think, of the Las Vegas tragedy, uh, clearly gun control in the U.S. is a massive issue. Uh, nothing like this uh, with one person doing this sort of damage. Uh, has happened uh, elsewhere and that really is a result of this crazy situation where you can have automatic weapons uh, in the US. So I hope it leads to a response uh, which stops that. Um, but what we should expect is more and more risk and individuals are more powerful, small groups are more powerful um, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, we've seen it with traditional weapons, we've seen it with the re use of things like vehicles, big trucks, vehicles taking people out in Nice in France and in London. Um, and what we will also, I think, increasingly see is the use of new technologies. So biopathogens, uh, people trying to create really bad stuff, sparking, a, try, attempting to create a financial crisis. We see it in cyber all the time that individuals are trying to disrupt uh, cyber systems. So I think it is interdependency and complexity and new technology play together to increase these risks. So what do you think is the single biggest threat to the world that hasn't got enough attention to? I think the single biggest threat to the world is pandemic. Uh, these have always been the biggest killers of humanity, but the risk is much greater now because uh, we are more connected than ever. The super spreaders of the goods of globalization, for example, airport hubs, can become the super spreaders of the bads, like a pandemic. And um, it's both the natural pandemics, which are evolving more and more rapidly because of more and more uh, concentration of people, the connection between animals and people, the proximity of slums uh, and bad hygiene in areas near airports in many of the rapidly growing emerging market cities. So all of these things increase the risk of new natural pandemics evolving uh, and they're spreading around the world more rapidly. Uh, but in addition to this, we now have the threat of uh, synthetically made of people actually building uh, a pandemic using new sequencing techniques. And that is particularly worrying because um, either by design or maybe even by accident, we could see a pandemic that hasn't been seen before or if it has been seen, we thought was eliminated, like smallpox um, coming back. And that would have dramatic consequences. So, so what are the measures that you suggest that we can maybe uh, foresee these risks and control them in advance? We need much more uh, cooperation. We need much more coordination. We need much more resources given to these issues. If you compare, for example, the amount of um, money and effort going into stopping pandemics to, say, stopping um, nuclear war or, or to the military in general, there's no comparison at all. Uh, military gets maybe uh, 500 to 1,000 times more resource and attention than pandemic. But actually, the threat to you and me, I think, is much greater from a pandemic. So it, one is to put more resources into it, to more work into it. Another is to use uh, more coordination. A pandemic can come from anywhere, often a very poor country. Uh, so we need to cooperate. We need early warning capability, and our mobile phones and other devices could provide that. 
um, and we need the capability to respond very quickly because with a pandemic, the more quickly you control it in a small area, the more hope you have of containing it. Once it's in an airport, uh, it can be anywhere in the, in the world in 36 hours. Ensuring that, that technologies are for good uh, and not either for bad because they lead to things that kill us or just put people out of work uh, or are used by very few people to increase their privileges uh, at the expense of others should be a social and political priority. Uh, I think what tends to happen is that we're not really aware of these technologies uh, until they do something. Um, we like many of them. We like our mobile phones and our smart devices and our connectivity. Um, and we think someone else is worrying about the bad technologies. We've talked about nuclear power. That's one bad technology. Um, but the or dangerous one, I think we need a bigger awareness of the technologies as a starting point, uh, not only amongst uh, politicians, which are not aware of many of these technologies, but also citizens, ourselves, um, to understand what they are. And then we need to make some choices once we have awareness about the speed of adoption, how they're going to be adopted, who's going to benefit, where, who, how, what the tax implications are, um, what we do with people that are affected by the technologies, for example. Um, if the whole system of banking becomes uh, virtual, based on the internet, then elderly people who are not on the internet suddenly find they can't do banking anymore. Yeah. It's, um, so groups are in society are left out of some of these new technologies. Um, and similarly, I think we will see uh, in some other areas. Artificial intelligence and robots will take a lot of jobs. My group in Oxford, uh, the, in the Oxford Modern School, uh, has estimated that 47% of US jobs are vulnerable to machine intelligence, and over 70% of Chinese jobs are vulnerable to robotics and uh, machine intelligence. Now, we're not saying the jobs will be taken, but this is a possibility that needs to be thought about and needs to be addressed by creating new jobs, by deciding what pace of adoption of the, of the technologies, many other choices you can make that affect those things. Yeah, but do you think this, um, sorry, let me rethink my questions. Uh, in your speech just now, you've mentioned that in the future, besides these threats that we've already seen, um, there is expected to be less and less trust in politicians and governments. So with the less trust in sovereignty, what is the world going to be like? Is it go going to be decentralized? Will there still be countries and borders? I think uh, countries have shown themselves remarkably resilient to change. In fact, there's a hundred more countries in the world today than there were a hundred years ago. The number of countries is multiplying. And now we see Catalonia trying to become a country. Um, Scotland might want to become a country. So I, don't, I think countries uh, will continue to be relevant. We're in a paradoxical time where the systems and our, is integrated and flows across borders are greater than ever, but countries are trying to assert their authority more and more, uh, not very effectively. That's why the trust is breaking down, both in terms of the opportunities coming from somewhere else that will lead us to have better, healthier lives, and in terms of the risks, even for a very, very big and now, you know, the one becoming the biggest economically as well country like China, mm. interdependence becomes more and more important. That's why President Xi, I think very wisely, has uh, stated so clearly that he believes there needs to be more cooperation more action on global public goods like climate change, uh, like the environment, like the global financial system, because I think he and the Chinese leadership recognize the Chinese future depends on a, a more balanced world and a more effective management of global problems. Now, that means that China in the process is a, both a leader, but also will be part of a global solution. And that is that giving up that sovereignty at times to be part of a global solution, making compromises to be part of a global solution is what 
a lot of countries don't want to do. Uh, and I think that's a big mistake because in that process you lose power over your own future. Um, so I think sovereignty can work as part of a cooperative arrangement. But if a country tries to just say, we will decide what we want to do completely alone, the extreme case, of course, is North Korea. Uh, it's a disaster for it, the country and the citizens.